Thank you. I first came to San Francisco 20 years ago. I was a young journalist on the UK edition of Wired magazine. And I joined Wired magazine in part because of this cover story. A cover story by John Katz about how Tom Paine would love this digital revolution that was kicking off in 94. How he would love the prospect that we now have it within our power to begin the world over again. To fix what is broken, not least government. But when I got to San Francisco and I met some of my colleagues on the US edition of Wired magazine, their vision for that future, for that beginning of the world again, was very, very different from mine. Rather than fixing government, some of them saw the opportunity of getting rid of government, to live on the internet, as Jen talked about earlier. My view is, we have to fix government. A functioning, trusted government is absolutely the core of civilization. History teaches us that. Our job is to help government take the opportunities of the digital revolution, uh, to regain trust and to become even more effective. Okay, <laughs> okay. can you go back one? Go back one. I'm going to spend some time on this. So, <laughs> so this appeared on the wall of GDS about two years ago. I don't know who did it, it's genius, okay? You've got to have a dream, okay? And the moment I'll know, we'll know, that we're genuinely making progress towards that level of simplicity is when I can put that up and you won't laugh. Okay? It should be possible for government to be that simple in a digital era. It should be possible to be that elegant, that respectful, that simple. There really aren't that many reasons. Government is not as complicated or as special or as big in an internet era as government thinks it is. But to really deliver that dream, we've got to do some hard yards inside the machine. We've got to get inside the machine and change it. And as you heard earlier, I spent uh, uh, some fantastic time helping my society set up, helping Tom Steinberg uh, in the early days as a trustee and a treasurer, and building some of the sites that held government to account. They work for you, uh, fax your MP, some of, the, some of the early stuff, holding representatives to account. But I learned that there's a limit to what you can achieve from the outside in terms of fixing government and helping government transition uh, through this revolution. There's only so much you can do. If you really want to change government, you've got to get inside it. You've got to get inside it. Because even if government decides it wants to change, it doesn't know how. It literally doesn't know how. Even if the will is there, it doesn't know what to do. And the best thing about this photo of the My Society volunteers from about a decade ago, apart from the hideous lack of diversity, and Mike Bracken looking like a farmer, <laughs> and the fact that my face is hidden, which is brilliant, um, is the fact that a good third of those people are now inside government. Okay, they're now inside the machine. This is Mike. How many were here last year? This is Mike Bracken, the farmer. Okay, about half of you. I'm going to very quickly go through what Mike talked about last year and give a quick update. So Mike talked about how our strategy is delivery. We do not write policy papers. We build things and then point at them, build things that meet the needs of users. That delivery is hinged around five things. Gov.uk, a platform for publishing, a single domain, uh, transformation of 25 exemplar services, large services, identity assurance, another platform, changing how we buy technology in government, and a performance platform to share how government services are doing. Gov.uk, 10 million users a week, 2,000 users across government, 24 government departments, 315 government agencies. It's won all sorts of design awards, but the reason I love it is because I see the qualitative and quantitative feedback from users, and I know it's simpler, clearer, and faster. It is respectful of users. It also costs about 50 million pounds a year less than the stuff that went before. Okay? A platform for the whole of government. Second uh, tranche of stuff we work on is helping the rest of government transform 25 of the most significant services, from introducing a single account for taxation, helping transform welfare, passports, prison visits, motoring services. We send teams out across the whole of the UK to help different bits of government develop the skills and capabilities and approaches 
to themselves transform the quality of their services to meet the rising expectation of users. And if you go to gov.uk slash transformation, you can learn more about them. As you can see, we've got six live now, 16 in beta. Uh, we're, we're really ramping ahead there. Identity assurance. Wow, things have really moved on in the UK in the last year here. We're about to launch a public beta uh, of a means of UK citizens verifying who they are online to government without having a single centralized national database with everybody's credentials in. Okay, it's going to be called gov.uk slash verify. Keep an eye on that. It's going to go live in public beta in a few weeks. It's genuinely transformative. We are continuing to change how government buys technology, frankly, to reduce self-harm to stop some of the mistakes of the past. This is Liam Maxwell, the government's CTO. Interestingly, he works for Mike Bracken. Technology in the UK government is there to support and enable service, digital service transformation. It does not exist in and of itself. Liam's job is to wander around government. When people ask for hundreds of millions of pounds for IT projects, he waves his iPhone at them, <laughs> okay? as well as saying no, and then helping them <laughs> get back to what the problem is around user need. He has single-handedly and his team have saved hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds over the past few years just by going back and asking a basic question. Why do you want to spend this money? What is the need that it meets? The name of the game is not buying technology. We've bought enough. The name of the game is transforming services. And finally, our performance platform, the third platform uh, that we've been focusing on, where we share performance information, 760 plus services that the government, central government offers in the UK, how many people use them, how much they cost, cost per transaction, completion rate, satisfaction rate, et cetera. Going to have a look, gov.uk slash performance. Um, after all, people have paid for us. We might as well share how we're doing. Mike also talked <coughs> about the blockers. What have we learned about what holds you back? He talked about the square of despair. That is the square of despair. The lack of money, people despair about that. Unhappy internal users suffering from appalling internal IT. Paranoia and mythology around security, crushing simple usability. And it really is mythology around security. It's not actually true security. And finally, possibly most importantly, procurement. Again, a lot of mythology around how we need to procure things in government, blocking a move to this agile, iterative development route. We have put huge effort into transforming how government procures digital services. We've introduced a new framework, the digital marketplace, with 1,000 plus suppliers on, pre-procured, small, medium, and large, tens of thousands of products and services available to buy uh, pay-as-you-go uh, uh, for anyone in the public sector in the UK. You have to transform procurement. We can't do this all in-house. We need vendors. Uh, unsexy work, but vital. As Mike said, we're, here, we're not here to change government websites. We're here to change government. Okay? That is the name of the game. <laughs> Do not shy away from it. And how is the question. Okay? I'm going to talk about three different aspects of how. They're not complete. Very briefly, I want to talk about the change in shape. Even more briefly, I need a change of language that's needed inside government. And in a bit more detail, I want to talk about changing the process by which government gets stuff done. Obvious point, but vital point. If we're going to change, if we're going to do that transition of the digital revolution, if we're going to do it on top of platforms that are horizontal, on which services sit, we need some bits of government that act horizontal, that run those shared platforms, that government as a platform. That is going to need a change of shape of government, which I'm sure is the same over here, is almost entirely vertical silos. We have institutions that top to bottom run their service and their infrastructure all the way through. Do not shy away from the fact that we're going to need to change the shape of government. We're going to need new institutions that act horizontally. Can't hide from that. Secondly, if you want to change an institution, change the language that it uses. Change the language that people talk about their work in, the narrative that they use. That's why we talk about digital rather than technology. We talk about user needs rather than requirements. We talk about alpha, beta, live rather than big bang launches. Okay, to change the institution, literally change the language that people use. Really delighted that Code for America has just hired Dan Hon to effectively uh, help uh, do that job for them. And finally, in a bit more detail, I want to talk about process. 
Um, one of the brilliant things about uh, the civil service, at least in the UK, I'm sure it's the same here, is that people like to follow the rules. Okay? So if you want to change things, just change the rules, and they'll follow them. Okay? They love process, absolutely love process. It gives people reassurance. That's the good thing, not a bad thing. So change the process. It really is that simple. A friend of mine back in the UK, a colleague, a brilliant colleague called Ade, helped me develop this. This is the existing process. <laughs> okay. And the insight that Adi helped me understand with this is that each step in this process is operated by a different group of people who then chuck the output of their step over the wall at the next slot. And even more interesting than that, each of those people are essentially a caste with an absolute hierarchy within that caste system. At the very top, you have the policy caste. Then you have the business analyst requirements. And right at the bottom, you have those who absolutely, actually meet people at the front line, people operating the service. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it ever worked. <laughs> okay. I don't see how you can have even the cleverest people in the world developing a policy and writing requirements, never testing it on users, running a process that takes years to run from end to end with no feedback loop, how can that ever have worked? Even before the internet. But now, when you've got expectation from people rising through the roof around the quality and convenience and uh, up-to-dateness of their services, it really is an existential threat. We, want, we can't adapt that process. We can't nibble at the edges. You have to reinvent it. Be open about the fact you're reinventing it. There's the old process at the top, the new process at the bottom. I'm sure I don't need to explain the different steps. Okay? I'm only going to point at this crown here, because we have a point after beta where any new service in the UK has to come to GDS to meet, for us to look at it and decide whether it meets a service standard, 26 points. Only when it meets that service standard does it get the crown put on it, okay? at which point it's live. We don't talk about policy and implementation or policy and then delivery. We don't think of them as two separate things. I think even thinking how you fix the gap is a category error. What we're doing here collectively with policy people in the room is digital service design. Okay. Example of change in the language. Here's how you do it if you're a leader in an organization. Okay. Get a room. Really important, actually. Get the right space for people to work in. Also, from our experience, really hard to do remotely. That's a bad thing to say, but it's really hard to do if people aren't in the same room. Get a small, talented, multidisciplinary team together. Even if it's a big change, even if the policy change is enormous, start small. Start diverse with the talents you have in the room. Yes, you need great designers, great developers, brilliant user researchers, product managers. You also need fantastic policy people in the room full time to bring the policy in a legislative context. You need fantastic security people who can help the whole team understand how to make the, make the service secure in the room. And most importantly of all, I'd say, you need people who operate services at the front line and who meet real users day in, day out and bring that reality uh, into the team. Dave, Trish. The way you get that team to work is to start by making sure they understand policy, the intent behind a policy change. What's the principle, what's the point of the change we're trying to make here? Okay. Let me give you an example. This is Carer's Allowance. It's one of those 25 uh, services we're transforming. Carer's Allowance is a, is a benefit that if you full-time care for someone else, you get paid 59 pounds a week by the state. Okay? Uh, when you, uh, I'm not even going to begin to describe the pain you have to go through as a carer uh, to get your £59 a week with the existing process. Okay? Other than to say there are 400 questions, potentially, you have to answer okay, to get your £59 a week, which, by the way, saves the state how much in terms of caring for people? The brilliant thing about this team that's done this up in Preston uh, is they went back to policy intent. And they said, well, the intent behind having a carer's allowance 
is actually to support carers. That's the purpose of the policy. Not to treat them as near criminals and suspect them every step of the way. They've got policy people in the room with operational people and they have stripped the vast majority of those questions away. Okay, they have co-designed with, user, with you, real users and I have seen videos of user research with, with real carers in tears at the fact that there's now a service, a service that respects them as carers, that speaks a respectful language to them, as Jen mentioned earlier. Okay. If you start with policy intent, you'd be surprised how much of the detritus of accreted nonsense you can strip away. Make sure your team understands your values and principles as an organization. You need to empower them as a team to make decisions without going up the chain all the time. A great way to do that is to write down some principles. Okay. Some of you may have seen these on gov.uk slash design principles. We indoctrinate everybody in GDS. These are our principles about how we work. If you want to learn more about these in detail, there's a former GDS developer, Francis Berryman, fantastic developer, stolen to us by love, from us by love. <laughs> um, he'll be running a session tomorrow uh, uh, in a workshop. Go. And then let the team focus on user needs. Okay. Give them the intent. Make sure they understand the values. Get the right people in the room. Leave them alone to focus on understanding the needs of users. Let me give you an example. Visiting, booking visits to a prison. It's one of the 25 examples I talked about. Policy intent is not to punish those visiting prisoners. Okay? We need to support them because the greater the connection is between a prisoner and home, the more likely they are not to reoffend when they leave. Okay? And yet, how do we treat them? The visitors booking? Well, I'm not even going to describe it. You probably can imagine. Okay? Brilliant team in the Minister of Justice with no GDS involvement at all. Done some fantastic work understanding the needs of those visitors. What do they actually need if they're going to have a digital service? Things like the fact that they need to choose three dates. You know, they, might need, they might need options. They don't need, you know, the paperwork just gets in the way. They've got 82% completion rate on this transaction. It's gone from 0% penetration to nearly 40%, over 40% digital penetration in a matter of weeks. Okay. Even within a group who typically aren't as online uh, as other groups. Okay. Leaving the team to focus on the needs of users, you can get your policy intent met in ways that may surprise you. And finally, possibly most important of all, is doing the hard work to make your service simple. Another one of those 25 is a transformation in the way we register, people register for vote in the UK. Previously, and rather embarrassingly, the legislation assumed that there was a head of a household, a man, who would decide who within his household had a right to vote. Literally, that's what the legislation said. Now, clearly, that was not sustainable in the 21st century, and so the legislation was changed. But the consequence of that, in terms of ensuring people remained on the electoral register, was potentially nearly 50 million people were going to have to validate their identity again in order to get back on the electoral register. Okay? That's non-trivial from a democratic perspective. <laughs> Best thing about this story was a handful of people, including uh, policy people, lawyers, even lawyers, uh, joined the team with developers and designers and researchers uh, and co-developed a way of automating the registration of a vast majority of that 50 million. Literally, the problem disappeared for most people in the UK. And even for the few million that left, you can register in an average of three minutes. Okay? A satisfaction rate of 92%. Is that not electoral gold, I'd have thought? That kind of satisfaction level? I think this is the best example we've hit yet of something approaching that dream. Okay. You can do it. You really can do it. You can do it so you don't laugh. You're not laughing anymore. Are you? Brilliant, that's success. Okay. I'm going to leave you with two thoughts. Okay. Be brave. Okay. Be brave enough to um, have a dream and believe it. And be bold enough to begin again. Don't lock yourself into putting lipstick, lipstick on top of legacy. Begin again. It's genuinely easier. Thank you very much.